Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 167, Encouragement to Take a Leap, coming to you on Thanksgiving Day, Thursday, November 28th, 2019. Well, since it is Thanksgiving in the U.S. today, as this episode goes out, and even though I'm not in the U.S., I am an American, though come to think about it, at the actual moment that this airs, I will be in the U.S. having Thanksgiving dinner for the first time in I don't know how long, so that's pretty cool. But right this second, it's not Thanksgiving, and so I wanted to tell you why I'm doing this particular episode today. We have a tradition of thinking about and trying to focus on the things that we're grateful for when we have Thanksgiving dinner. Sometimes people go around the table and say it. Um, In my experience, it's mostly left unsaid, but people do try to be thinking about the things and the people that they're grateful for. And so I wanted to do something, give you an episode today that would somehow give you Um, some encouragement to do something um, amazing or to just think about the things that you are really grateful for that you're already doing that are amazing. So I gave a speech a few weeks ago at the Rotary Club. Never done this before. It's kind of a new member speech. It's called an ego speech, which at first I'm like, "Uh, (laughs) I like talking and I like talking about myself, but an ego speech that sounds a little overwhelmingly about me. And I was trying to think about how I can do this speech in a way that makes my audience feel really glad that they were there listening, that encourages them. And then that's when I got the idea, well, of course, I want to talk about encouragement because I'm really beginning to learn in this last year, in 2019, that encouragement is a gift that I have that I fairly easily give to other people. And it's one of the things I enjoy most in my life is just encouraging other people, whether it's a little bit or a lot in writing or in life or just about in anything. I just like making people feel happy and relaxed. I like making you feel happy and relaxed and like you have more power to do things in your life than maybe you're believing right this second, that you have abilities that the world needs you to use. These are the sorts of things that make me super excited. So I decided that I would talk about this in this speech. Now, near the end of the speech, I talk about something that I haven't actually said out loud before, except for the two or three very close friends. Thank you, Susie May, for uh, helping me work through it. I want to make encouraging people part of my life work. Now, when I think of life work, I think of things that are part of your business, things that you get paid for, as well as just doing because you love them. Um, I'm a little nervous because the thing I really want to do, finding a way to be an encourager of lots and lots of people, I'm not 100% sure how to make a living out of that. But I think that I am very hesitantly putting my toe in the water of saying, okay, God, I'm going to do this and hopefully it'll either make me money or it won't take away too much time from me doing work that needs to bring in money to pay the groceries and the rent. Um, But I really, really, really feel like you need to use your gifts. I mean, I talk about this a lot. I try to encourage you to use your gifts and I feel like I need to encourage me to use my gifts. I'm reading a book right now by Brene Brown called The Gifts of Imperfection. And one of the things that she says in the book is that courage is contagious, especially the courage to be your authentic self, your real self, or in my case, for me to have the courage to be the real kitty. And this is me, the real kitty. This is me in this ego speech, putting myself out there in a really scary way. Scary because it's vulnerable. Being vulnerable means that you could get hurt. Now, one of the other things that Brene says in her book is that you need to remember to tell your story just to those people who've earned the right to hear it. Now, I can't say that I for sure know what she means by it, but I get the impression that she's talking about the same sort of thing that Jesus was talking about when he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. 
don't give th- things that are precious and important to you to people who don't care at all and will trample you and not even care. So I was thinking, who do I want to who do I want to share this with? Up until a couple of weeks ago, I'd only shared it with just a couple close friends who I really believed were going to um, support me and love me, even if they were willing to say that the idea wasn't a good one, they would still love me and I would be safe in that kind of vulnerability. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what, I want to be that kind of vulnerable person person around people that I care about, which includes the people at my Rotary Club and includes you. I've told you before, I do this podcast for you. I want you to feel encouraged, uplifted, motivated, inspired, excited. I want to make you laugh. I want to make you think. And um, I'm not against it if you get moved to the extent that you cry, though that is most definitely not something that I am manipulating my words to do. But I just think that, um, yeah, sometimes tears just help you to see that something is moving you more maybe than you even realized. So I am sharing my ego speech from the Rotary Club with you, um, sharing with you some exciting, scary things that I want to do and and I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to say that one more time, I am going to do it. I'm not exactly sure how, I'm not sure what will come from it, but I really hope that the next 22 minutes encourages you and makes you think about the things that you're grateful for and the things about yourself that you're grateful for, the things that you like about you. Because in a lot of ways, that's what this speech was for me, being willing to admit this is the, these are the things, this thing in particular and some of these other things, these are things that I actually really like about myself and I want to use them in some way that makes the world a better place. So I apologize for my um, very scratchy voice. I was still sick when I did this speech, but I very much hope that this encourages you and that it gives you some things to think about as you're thinking about all the rest of the things in life that you're grateful for. And just to remind you, I'm grateful for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for telling your friends. And thank you for thinking about ways that you can use your life and your gifts to go make the world a better place for all of us. Have a great Thanksgiving day, and we'll talk to you again later. My name is Kitty Buchholz, and I am from the Midwest of the United States. Now, I have no idea why it's called the Midwest, because it's in the eastern third of the United States. Uh, But it's the area that includes the Great Lakes Um, So if you look on a map or a satellite picture and there's a whole bunch of water surrounding, and if you know anyone from Michigan, surrounding a piece of land that looks a little like this. (laughs) Apparently, if you're five, you are told that this was the land left over after the glaciers melted and Paul Bunyan had dropped his mitten on the ground. And so where the mitten was on the ground, uh, the, the, the land stayed and then the water melted all around it. So you get told lots of lovely stories when you're from the Midwest. Fake news. Fake news, yes, that's right. If only we had known that. No, it's probably good for second graders not to be able to say that in class. Did you vote for Trump? Let's move on. So because this is the International Rotary, I thought it would be fun just to say that the area that I'm from It has a lot of Scandinavians who settled there, uh, a lot of Germans, Polish, and a lot of people from the UK. So I have a little bit of everything, I think, in my blood, and I only found out the week before I moved here that I also have Swedish blood, so that's rather exciting. I'm determined to find out who are the people in the only photograph I have of Swedish relatives from 1800 and something. Um, But this is really the group of people who formed me and made me. So I was born Kathleen Rose McIntyre. I'm the only child in my family who has a nickname. I was um, referred to as Kitty in the telegram that went out to my uh, grandparents saying that I had arrived. And I never did get a good answer from my mother as to why I was the only one with a nickname, but I rather like it. Because unless a child is calling a cat, I'm pretty sure that I'm always the one who's being referred to if I hear my name. (laughs) Um, Also, though, I have a lot of Johnsons and Wilsons and Larsons and lots of other sons in my family. So it makes me feel uh, excited to be connected to this area of the world for the first time ever. 
I lived in the woods in kind of the middle of nowhere, about 20 kilometers from the nearest town of 2,000 people. So that was the town. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so really, I'm a country girl. I went to town for groceries with mom, school, church, but otherwise, I grew up in the countryside, and I was pretty much formed in the countryside, uh, riding bicycles and horses and building tree forts and trying unsuccessfully to learn to swim, unsuccessfully to learn to fish, much to my grandfather's disappointment. <laughs> um, and my identity and sense of self was pretty much developed with the kind of people that I grew up with. It, at least at the time that I was growing up, you know, things change as, uh, as time goes by. Um, the kind of people who live in an area grow and change, new people come, older people leave. Um, but at the time, in that moment that I was growing up in this area, it was a land of relatively simple people who expected to work hard and get a modest, nice life in return. They expected you to respect your elders and to look out for your neighbors. And that most people, I think, were pretty much expected that you would at least go to church on Easter and Christmas. <laughs> so that was kind of... Um, the, uh, the value system and the lifestyle and everything that kind of formed me from five, age five to age 25. <clears throat> what I remember, I'm a novelist now, and what I remember as my first memory of storytelling, uh, I have two good ones. Um, one is sitting on the floor with a blackboard propped up against the wall while my mom was sorting laundry and writing stories in chalk. And I was probably six or seven years old, so the stories were probably three or four or five sentences long. And then I would say, Mom, Mom, and she would read them and tell me how wonderful I was and make some suggestions. And then we would erase the board and I'd write another story while she was doing laundry. Now, as a child, this is a precious memory to me because it was an adult who I loved and respected telling me that the gifts that I valued in myself already at a young age, the things that I found were fun and interesting, that she valued them too. And that was really important. Now that I'm older, I also recognize that she valued something that would keep me out from under her feet while she was trying to get work done. <laughs> But she always made me feel like what I was doing was special, and that really um, went a long way for me. I don't actually remember a time when I wasn't writing or telling stories. The other story that does just stick with me, though, is the time that I was telling something or other to my grandmother who had come to visit. Let's see, the Swedish way would be my far more. <laughs> and um, it's one of the few words that I have that I know <laughs> so far. Um, she'd come to visit. And um, whatever I said, I have no idea what I was telling her. And she said, you are such a little fibber. And she said it with that grandmotherly sense of love. And I was like, what's a fibber? And my older sister, who was probably 13 or 14 at the time, and so that should tell you right there what her attitude was towards it. It means you're a liar. <laughs> I was like, no, no I, it just, it was, it was, the story was better this way. <laughs> So, um, so it's always been about stories and getting people's attention, um, having people uh, get some laughter or some smiles. Or My husband likes to say that I like to be the center of attention, but it isn't that. If I were the center of attention in a room of lions, this would not be a good day. But what I really like is making people feel things and laugh about things and think about things. That's why I really like to be a storyteller. And not just stories, but, um, but the way that I look at the world and think about life. Uh, when I was 13, we had a social studies class, and the teacher asked everybody, go around the room, what would you do if you won a million dollars? The lottery had recently come to our state, and it was a million dollars. And I don't know for sure that, um, that this was the case for the adults as well, but definitely, you know, as a teenager, a million dollars was so much money. Not really, nobody would buy a lottery ticket if the lottery was only a million dollars winnings now. Um, but when we got to me, I said I would give some to my parents and buy some things for you know, family and friends, and I would save some money from college and buy some things, and then I would just give the rest away. For one thing, a million dollars seemed like far too much money for anybody to be able to physically spend anyway, and there was lots of other people who needed money for things. I mean, 
granted, I was 13, but I've always had this sort of idealistic sense of um, if I've got enough, then surely if there's extra, then we should, we should all have enough. Uh, but what I remember is that everyone laughed, including my teacher. And they said, you would never do that. You would never give away a bunch of money if you had it. So that also was something that formed me and made me just start wondering about people, attitudes, uh, how we felt about the world and our neighbor. Because on the one hand, I'm supposed to take care of my neighbor. On the other hand, I'm being told you would never do that. So it was a lot of things to think about. Um, I was the first person to graduate from college in my family, even though both of my parents, my brother, my sisters, everybody went to college, but I was the first person to to actually finish, which um, for us, you know, felt like quite an accomplishment. My grandfather raised a family during the Great Depression, and um, he was pretty sure that college was a good idea. He was absolutely sure if I went to college, I should go into banking, because at the end of the Great Depression, the bankers were the only ones left who still had some money. And I told him I would think about it. (laughs) But this is a very practical, pragmatic area of the world. And um, I always assumed, based on the the kinds of people who had settled there, that that must mean that this area is also, or was once, I don't know, a practical, pragmatic area of the world. And so um, when I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my life, Uh, Unfortunately, it didn't take very long for me to respect my elders and do the practical thing, and I became an accountant and a financial analyst, and I put writing to the side. I never actually stopped writing, but um, it certainly wasn't something that was going to be pursued. So while I didn't stop writing, I also felt a certain degree of feeling like I had to hide what I was writing because what I really liked was romances. Now, I I was never really one to read like Harlequin romances. To me, that um, at the time, before I started reading them, um, you know, as as an older woman, older woman, like, I mean, not as a teenager, but like in my 20s. um, But uh, earlier, you know, I would just be like, that's not realistic at all. Like, I like real people's stories. I love to listen to stories about how did you meet and how did you, what did you do when you proposed and, and you've been married how long? So how does that work? Like, tell me stories. I would love to listen to these stories of our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Myers, who, again, in my teenage sensibility, I'm sure this is not what they looked like, were this little old couple with white hair who walked really slow and held hands everywhere they went, and they would tell me stories, how they met, and all these things that happened in their life. And I just thought they were the coolest people ever, and I wanted to be them, and I wanted to have that life and be a little old person with white hair walking around holding hands with my partner and telling young people like how wonderful it is to be married. <laughs> so needless to say, um, I, I am, in fact, happily married to my college sweetheart, and in six months, we'll celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. Wow. <laughs> so I'm still quite into the romantic and happy endings, and my first book was, in fact, a romantic comedy, Little Miss Lovesick was the first book that I published. Um, it's set in Michigan, actually. It's set in Traverse City, Michigan, um, the real town that I lived in, and i um, It's about life the way that I know it, the way that I see it. So a lot of my characters tend to be um, different versions of myself or my friends. Um, It's made it very difficult for me when it comes to uh, um, marketing and uh, reading reviews because sometimes I'm like, okay, um, I have managed to offend everyone and not hit any market, it would appear. (laughs) Because the people that I tend to write about um, are Christians often in one way or another, um, like solid or kind of, I don't know anymore, or I'm just angry at God, he must be pissed at me and I'm pissed at him back. Um, and shockingly, people have sex in my books. I mean, they're married. I thought that was okay. But some of the Christian reviews that I got were like, oh my gosh, there's sex and bad language. And I'm thinking, oh shit, you don't like that? <laughs> So, being myself has been great. Marketing my work has been far more challenging. Um, however, um, the, the romance and the comedy, those are my two favorite things. But my other favorite thing is, 
I'm a strong believer based on my own life experiences that we all have more to us than we realize. And based on the fact that I'm 51 now and I still think that, my guess is if I were to ask some of you who are older than me, I think that you would say, yeah, I think that I even still have more power than I realize, more things that I could do in life, more things that I could do to change the world to be a better place. And for me, one of the things that makes me most excited and happy about thinking about, you know, what kinds of characters that I could I write that I could do this is superheroes. <laughs> so the second book that I put, put out is the beginning of a superhero series for women called Unexpected Superhero. And um, I also, when I, I wanted to not um, offend anyone by wearing a t-shirt, <clears throat> and I also couldn't afford to rip the buttons off this shirt. Um, <laughs> But I did make t-shirts when I was at a comic book convention that say, you have more power than you realize. And then it's the name of my series and and my author name. And I love this t-shirt because it makes me feel, I actually wear this t-shirt when I'm feeling like I need a a pep talk. And I work at home by myself, so I'm going to wear a t-shirt that gives me a pep talk. (laughs) And I have found it to be... um, I found this kind of slogan or tagline to be something that actually works in most of the areas of my life. And it helps me when I'm helping friends, encouraging people around me who are going through any number of big or small things, just to help them to know that um, they can get through it no matter how tough it is. They probably know the answer and they just need to talk it through and find it. Um, That there are... Uh, so many ways that people are going to come together around them and support them and help them get through them, get through whatever it is, carry them through it. And it occurred to me when I was um, finishing the the last couple of weeks of my job, I had a nine-month contract job at Massive Entertainment, the video game company here in town. And um, my husband works there permanently full-time, so we get to we get to make Malma our home for a really long time. Yay, maybe forever. Shh, don't tell my husband that I keep saying maybe forever. <laughs> um, but maybe. Um, <clears throat> it occurred to me the last couple of weeks that I was there that the thing I loved most about going to work every day was saying good morning to a whole bunch of people that nobody said good morning to and saying, how are you, and memorizing the names from people from 70 different countries, that um, people were like, I know I work near you, and I know we sit near each other, and I know your name starts with an E, but you know, other than that, I figure we're good. You know, but I would be like, no, so Iwa? I, like, no, I, Eva? Eva? Wait, how do you say your name? And I would really work on it. And I would try to, to and I would try to learn names that I was like, I, I can't understand what you're saying. I'm so sorry, but I'm determined. And I would have people write it down phonetically. And I'm like, this is the thing I love. It's making people feel like for these three minutes they were standing by the coffee machine, I genuinely think you're interesting and important and worth the time to say good morning to. And you and you and you, I know that what I need to do is wait until the 10 o'clock break and then say good morning because you need more coffee than other people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would begin to try to be like, it's okay, I'll say good morning to you in a little bit. And then later I'd be like, good morning, how are you? And that was my most fun, most wonderful thing. So here I am, a person who has a writing podcast. I love to write. Um, I write mostly fiction, but I also really like to write nonfiction. Um, Mostly things that have to do with teaching writers or people who want to be writers and aren't ready to say they are writers yet. Um, How to do any number of different kinds of writing. Uh, I, I teach a lot of stuff that has to do with fiction, but also I've had people in my classes who write memoirs, so story of their own lives, story of their grandparents' lives, that sort of thing. And um, how-to books. Um, I've helped pastors write books about how to be a pastor of a church. And I, I, I just love writing, and I love teaching writing. And I think part of it is because I love that encouraging, you can do it. This chapter is almost perfect, and I know that you can make it even better. Just try it one more time. And I love this this encouraging people thing. So I am really, really, really scared because thanks to being in business navigation in Sweden for the last six months, which we got our peeps here who are all like, woohoo, 
you guys are awesome. We came to support you. Um, I've been thinking about my business for six months, thinking about, do I want to make any changes from the way I've been doing things? Do I want to write anything that's different? Do I want to write something that's so different that I need a new name as well? So I'll have to run two names and two websites. Oh, so much work. Um, do I want to teach in a different way? I've been doing a lot of things online because then I can reach people all around the world. But I love being with people person to person. How can I do both? So I did one scary thing, which was I told my BNS people that I have finally committed. I am going to run a writer's conference in August of 2020 here in Malma. Very, very excited. Um, I already have at least one speaker from the U.S. coming out. She's very excited. Um, but, the, but that's something that I, I've already done, and I know how to do it, and I think it's going to be fine. The scariest thing is that I want to take this thing that's really important to me, that's in my heart, that, that to me defines me. It's hard to be a writer and not be defined by your writing. There's probably a lot of people here who love your work so much. It's hard not to be defined by it. And I find that as a writer as well. But I, can, I can't keep an arm's length, but I can keep like this much distance. I'm like, okay, these people don't like my book. It doesn't mean they don't like me. They might not like me, but it doesn't mean they don't like me. But there's this thing that I want to do that I'm really scared because it is me. And anyone who, who wouldn't like it kind of really would be saying, I don't like you, and I don't like the kind of person you are. And I, I haven't decided to do it, but it seems like an ego speech is a good place to say, I've got this thing. I think it's important. I have a gift. I really believe that God gave us gifts to share them. I mean, nobody, who has ever had Christmas morning where everybody goes to their room and they open up their gifts. Wow, this is really cool. And then they go back and they meet together and, you know, talk about it. That's that's not the way it works. Everybody's together. We open our gifts together. We like make snowballs out of wrapping paper and throw them at each other together. And I really, really, really want to encourage people to do that. But that's my big, scary, wonderful, awesome thing. I want to do something with my life that is about encouraging people. Because I think that the opportunity, giving people the opportunity to be encouraged is worth putting yourself on the line, giving people the opportunity to feel a little bit better about themselves or their lives or their neighbors, that is worth being scared that somebody's not going to like you. I heard a comedian named Michael Jr. give a TED Talk. I love this guy. He's so cool. He's also from Michigan. That helps. Um, and he said that at one point he realized that his job as a comedian should not be going into a room and trying to get laughs. You know, people who like to be up in the front of a room, they, we are getting something out of it. We like being up here. We like having eyes on us. We like having people laugh at the right times and be interested and nod. And as a comedian, that's all it is, you know. Um, you want people to laugh at your jokes because if you don't get people to laugh at your jokes, you won't have a job. But he said that one day he realized that maybe the better way wasn't about getting people to give him their laughter, but giving them an opportunity to laugh. And to have that moment of, um, you know, laughter brings out all sorts of delightful chemicals in your brain, legal ones that God put there on purpose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and there are times when oh, a laugh is exactly what you needed. And he realized that if he could give people the opportunity to laugh, then he got even more joy out of it. And I was listening to this speech just a few weeks ago thinking, that's it. I need to give people an opportunity to feel like love works and it lasts, to feel like no matter how scary things are and how many people you think are after you, you do have power by yourself and as part of a group to get yourself through it. Um, I think that the best book I've written so far is the last one, where there's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of relationships, there's a lot of love and laughter, but it's about you know the real problems of how in the world do you take two lives and make them one life and, and have it be um, good enough for both people because you're scared that maybe it wouldn't be. And then you realize that <laughs> you know if everything went even a little bit well and everybody worked really hard, it's actually so much more. Like, 
I, I just still cannot believe how much more marriage is than what I thought it was 10 years ago or certainly 30 years ago. And I want to encourage people in these things that I really believe in. And I'm not 100% sure how to do it and actually make enough money to pay my rent doing it. And I haven't actually committed to doing it yet because I'm scared because it's more personal than anything else in my life. But um, as the, the end of my ego speech, now you know something about me that not a lot of people know. So um, I hope that things that I said tonight were encouraging to you. And I thank you very much for listening to my story.